Well, good morning. Pastor Chris here, Glory Baptist Church. I'm even at my office at the moment. I came out to record the sermon so that we would have good sound and good video quality for everyone to watch. Just quickly wanted to catch you up on a few things. First, wanted to talk about just what's going on in the world, coronavirus and all the other things. They, uh, a lot of things right now trigger fear. And, and fear, of course, is one of uh, our enemies, Satan's, most powerful weapons that he uses against us. Worry, anxiety, fear, it can overwhelm us and, and can create a, a thick shadow of darkness in our lives, controlling our every move and um, really weighing us down. And there's so much that's been going on, so much for people to be concerned about. And, and there is right reason to be concerned. We want you to be healthy and happy and safe. That is certainly true. Uh, there's people facing job loss or at least temporary unemployment or or reduced income uh, and concerns about retirement accounts and concerns about health and concerns on whether or not we've wisely stored up enough toilet paper to last through this. Lots of reasons to worry at the moment. Uh, the list, of course, goes on and on and on. Yet what happens so often with many of the things that we do end up worrying about they never come to happen. Um, that's not to say coronavirus isn't real, 100% real, and people are getting sick with it every day, and we need to take that seriously. But a lot of the things that we do worry about in life uh, are not things that are really worth our time. And so would encourage you to find a healthy balance. For some of us, that really means turn off the news for a while. Um, the news is filled with all sorts of informational things, but it's also filled with chaos, murder, death, mayhem, and, and more bad news about all the other things that we might otherwise already be worrying about. And we don't need to feed that. So would encourage you, turn off the news. And be informed, be wise, but don't be one who worries. There's so much in the Bible that speaks about this, that speaks about us not fearing, um, not worrying. Over and over and over again, as you read through the Bible, God's counsel for us is do not fear. Uh, we are not a people who are guided by fear, but we are a people of faith, and we need to live that out. So I would encourage you, if you are struggling, that's okay. We all struggle at times. Reach out to somebody. If fear and anxiety are getting the best of you, give me a call. Uh, I can talk with you. We can Zoom meeting, or we can put you in contact with a professional uh, who can help walk you through the time that uh, you need to help kind of sort through things and make yourself feel better. So don't let fear, don't let anxiety, don't let those things take control in your life. Guard your heart and, and keep your focus on the things you need to be focused on. That's keeping yourself healthy, that's protecting your family, and that's making much of Jesus each and every day. And if we do that, um, I do think God will be glorified and great things will come from this period of social distancing or whatever you want to call it. Um, with that, would like to share just a few announcements and then we are going to move on into the rest of our time of worship together. Uh, if you haven't already, would encourage you following the sermon to go on maybe YouTube and follow the links that we've provided, watch some worship videos, sing loud, nobody's going to judge you. The dog might, if you got a dog, if you don't really hit that note just right. He may howl along with you, but that's okay. Dogs need to worship too. But anyhow, pick a few worship songs and sing and rejoice if you didn't do so before worship. Um, enjoy. If you don't like the songs we've picked, that's okay. That's uh, the great thing about worshiping at home. You get to pick your worship list, and so you can pick your all-time favorites. And if you don't end up with the songs you wanted, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. So that is one of the advantages of worshiping at home. Uh, but as I said, a few quick announcements. Uh, if you'd like to find the bulletin, they are available online. We post them each week. Trish uh, continues to do a great job with that, and we'll provide a link for you to download that. It's on the church's website. If you go to the website and go across the top and under media, that's where you'll find all the sermons archived, and it's also where you will find the worship bulletins archived as well. And there you will find in the worship bulletin the sermon notes if you would like those. 
Also, we have online giving. We kind of kicked this off right before all of this started, but uh, not everyone was able to get signed up. And if you would like to get signed up for online giving, uh, please let us know and we will set you up with that. We will make sure you have all the information you need. Uh, we do appreciate your support financially through these times. Um, we still have expenses and, uh, and things that the church continues to have to pay for. And uh, we do appreciate your generosity and your continuing to support. And so if giving online would be easier, uh, we would love to enable that. You can always, of course, mail in a check or, or drop it by and stick it in uh, between the doors of the church and we'll get it when we get here. And so thank you for uh, sharing that, your gifts with us in that way. Uh, other things we have going on, we do continue to provide opportunities for our students to learn. If you haven't seen, Pastor Kevin has been recording videos for Sunday School and for Mad for Christ. Uh, it seems that he's enjoying his time doing that. He, he's been uh, making a fire out in the backyard and sitting there at the fire and grabbing out the Bible and spending some time in the Word of God. And he's been posting those on his YouTube channel, and we've been trying to link to those so that everybody can find them. So our Mad for Christ students, the 7th through 12th grade students, as well as Sunday school, can have that information and, and be part of that. Additionally, I've been recording each Wednesday uh, a video for our younger students in the Kidmen program, which is preschool through uh, sixth grade. And I've been recording uh, the weekly lesson there, and you can find those as well. And we, we post all that to Facebook, and uh, they're also archived on YouTube. So if you would like to uh, watch those videos, we are trying to make that available for everyone to take care of and uh, help their kids grow spiritually. Um, we are using Facebook kind of as the central hub of things because most people have Facebook, or at least most of the people who are online have Facebook. And so that seems to be a good central point where we can get the most information out to the most people at the fastest pace. Uh, we will continue to keep the, the website updated as well. But uh, Facebook is kind of going to be the hub of most of the things that we are doing. With that, we have a Zoom meeting. If you haven't gotten a Zoom meeting, I would recommend it for any electronic device you might have. A Zoom meeting will work pretty much as long as it's internet connected and it's got a screen, you can use Zoom meeting. So we're using that for Wednesday Bible studies. We can use that for committee meetings. We can use that just for gatherings. If you would say want to get together uh, digitally with four or five friends and just have a social hour, uh, we could make that happen. Just let me know and I can create that and, and we'll make that work. So lots of opportunities there, and it's it's live. It's got video. It's got sound. You can have multiple people, multiple people all at once. Um, it, it works really fantastically well. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is we are working on a calling tree to call our people in our church and people associated with our church. If um, you would like to be somebody who is willing to make some of those calls, we could use a few more partners. Right now we have the prayer team, and I'm going to be asking the deacons to do it. Uh, I'm going to be calling some of them. I'm going to be asking uh, Pastor Kevin to do some of the student families to just connect with people, make sure everybody has everything you need, and, and to make sure that we are looking out for one another as we as the people of God need to do. The great thing is in all of this, the church, it's not this building. The church is the people. The church is you. The church is me. Wherever we are, we can bring the church into the world. And so I would challenge you to look at this time uh, of social distancing as an opportunity. Uh, look at it as a chance to do a number of things, but as much as anything, to grow spiritually. Spend some time in the Word. Spend some time in prayer. Think about ways you can still make an impact. Um, be willing to uh, reach out to your neighbors and, and love and serve. And um, do so, of course, with lots of hand sanitizer. We want you to be safe. But... Uh, Certainly do so in a winsome way that represents God's love well. Those are the quick announcements I wanted to share with you. And hopefully we will see you soon, um, at the very least digitally. And looking forward to seeing you all once again in person. While the church is not the building, it's awesome when we get to get together. And, and I do miss it. I miss the sound of Sunday morning of hearing the lobby beginning to fill. Uh, the, the lobby goes from very quiet when I get here to a, a dull roar by the time worship is about to start. Uh, I look forward to once again be standing on the stage, looking all at your beautiful smiling faces, uh, lifting our voices together in worship and song, uh, hearing Sherry on the piano and sharing the Word of God with you in person. I look forward to that. But in the meantime, we're going to make the best we can with what we have. We are going to glorify God and we are going to praise and worship Him. So thanks for being part of the Life of Glory Baptist Church. Let's worship.
Good morning. I'm Sandy Westwig, and I am part of the missions committee here at Glory. And uh, I wanted to highlight one of our missionaries that we support. And for reasons of where they're at, is quite sensitive. So it will be Mr. S and Miss B when I talk about them, just to keep their identities safe and not cause any harm to them. This was their Christmas letter that they had sent out, and I just kind of felt that kind of fell into line with what a lot of things that have been going along in our world right now. Um, she had, had started reading a passage in Exodus, Exodus 13, 7 through 18. Um, it says, when Pharaoh let the Israelites go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines, even though it was nearby. For God said, the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. So he led the people around toward the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness. And that was kind of sets the precipice of her start of her Christmas letter. She writes, It was early in the morning, and the sun was just beginning to stream in and warm the cold mud brick walls of her house. The vendors that often lined the streets outside her gate had yet to break the silence of the night with their shouts of what they were selling. As a seeker of silence and solitude that morning, I was grateful for their delay. I made my way to the coveted corner of our Tashkas. The fluffy, oversized pillows that lined the walls of our living room. And I began to read the familiar story of God rescuing the Israelites from the mighty hand of Pharaoh. But when I arrived at this particular set of verses, my eyes filled with tears that continued to fall through the rest of the story. What struck me that morning was the intentionality of God in choosing to lead his people along the road of the wilderness. The wilderness road wasn't the most direct route to their destination, and the way was unknown and foreign to them. By my standard, that's not a very strategic or efficient way to go. Yet we see God's diverted them away from the nearby road and sent them along the roundabout way. But the beauty of our God is that he is present with us, not because of anything we've done, but simply because he delights in us. He loves us, and he longs to show us his glory by actively and miraculously participating in our lives. As he led the Israelites, he read, the, we read, excuse me, that the Lord went ahead of them, guiding them and never departing from before his people. God knew the wilderness road would lead the Israelites to the shores of the Red Sea. He knew the hardened heart of Pharaoh, and it was no surprise to him when the Pharaoh changed his mind, gathered his army, and fiercely pursued the people of Israel. Caught between a merciless Pharaoh and the depths of the sea, the Israelites were trapped between two overwhelming circumstances, neither of which they could navigate on their own. And it's there, at the edge of the water, we see the intentionality of God in leading them along that road. For the first time since their departure from Egypt, God moves in behind his people, filling the space between them and Pharaoh's army. It's in that sacred space found along the road of the wilderness that God fights on behalf of his people, a fight only he could win. We know the rest of the story, God miraculously parts the depths of the Red Sea, creating a spacious place for his people to walk through. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me, Psalms 18, 18 through 19. There is a mysterious beauty we behold along the road of the wilderness. Through the roundabout way is often difficult, We'll have to be crazy to want to travel it again. It's in that holy and sacred space that we encounter the faithfulness of our God. As Christmas approaches 
and as I find my own heart navigating what feels like a wilderness road, I'm reminded that hope has come in the most mysterious and beautiful way, ushered in on, in on a promise to rescue us and never depart. So it is with this Christmas finds, if this Christmas finds you along the road of the wilderness, or if God has, God in his faithfulness has brought you out into the spacious place this season, may we all experience deeply the presence of Jesus, Emmanuel, the God who came in to dwell within us. And um, Miss B had wrote that on their Christmas letter, and they had some highlights they had on the back of the of their letter. And the one thing that kind of struck me was, even from these are a young couple from Minnesota. The the farmer isn't far from him. He has a greenhouse that he tends to um, help supply their food need. So if anybody has a natural way to get rid of aphids, he would greatly appreciate it, I think, because I think it kind of decimated some of his crop. But um, his gifting and what he loves to do is to fly. And God is using that for his purpose in a very barren and dangerous place right now. And he has been able to do what he loves, and also because he loves God, that he's able to help spread the word of God for the people that he's working for and with. And it just still strikes me as, uh, you know, a young couple that they agreed, you know, that this was a plan in their life to go into the mission field and to serve. So it's something to think about when you are getting ready and a lot of us are afraid to step out and go on that mission field figuring we're going to end up in Africa and have to eat worms. <laughs> but it's what's on your heart. God uses your talents and your treasures that you he has given you that uh, he will take you to places that fit your heart and your abilities that he has given you. So unless God has placed on His your heart to uh, minister to the African people, I don't think we have to fear where he'll take us next. Thank you. Well, if you have a Bible nearby, grab that. Otherwise, grab your phone or your iPad or maybe pull up on the side of the screen that you're viewing on here. We're going to be looking at the book of John once again, starting in John chapter 18, verse 28. And I'm going to read on into uh, chapter 19 and share those words with you. So again, John 18, verse 28. Uh, just a bit of the background. Um, Jesus has been brought out of the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he had been betrayed by Judas at this point, and then uh, been brought, first of all, to Annas, the high priest. Peter, if you'll recall, has denied Jesus three times. Uh, the rooster has crowed in fulfillment of, of Jesus' prediction, and that kind of brings us to where we're at here in John 18, verse 28. Uh, there it reads, then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. 
but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again, and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat up at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. How many of you have ever seen the triple Oscar winning movie, The Pianist? It's about a a Jewish pianist whose name is Vladislaw Spellman. And uh, he's caught up in the overthrow of, of Warsaw. And the city has been overrun as it was by Nazi Germany. And he's witnessed his, his mother, his father, his brother, his sister, and something like 300,000 others taken into trains to death camps and off to gas chambers. And he manages to escape. And so there's a point in the movie where he's hiding in this, this bombed out, disheveled husk of a home Uh, living in an attic and just trying to survive. And he's trying to open a tin of fruit and he's actually using some, uh, uh, like a fire poker as a hammer and a a shovel, you know, for cleaning out your fireplace. And and he's banging on that. And he's he's literally neared the point of starvation. And and just as he's opening up this tin can, it it goes kind of, He hits it, and it goes askew, it goes rolling across the floor, and and suddenly the camera focuses on the presence of somebody else. Uh, It's a Nazi German officer, in fact. And the officer looks at him, and Spielman is frozen, of course. And he says, Who are you? And then he asks him whether he's a Jew, and Spillman says, yes. And then he says, well, what do you do? And the man says, I am. And then he kind of corrects himself and he says, I was a pianist. So the the Nazi German officer says to him, well then, play me something. There's a piano happens to be right there. And so 
Vladislav Spillman sits at the, this dusty piano and, and he begins to play Chopin's Ballad Number no. 1 in G minor. And, and, and it's the, the, the most moving and, and, and probably sublime seven or eight minutes in, in which uh, simultaneously the, the horror and, and the ugliness and the inhumanity of that moment of Nazi Germany and what they were doing, um, in the midst of that there shines something of absolute exquisite beauty in this tender moment of music playing which you're led to believe in the movie the man thinks is probably his last minutes on earth. And even if you don't know who Chopin is, I, I dare you not to, to be moved if you watch that scene. It's, it's so powerful. And in the passage here, there's another Jew here, and, and he too is standing in the, the midst of man's inhumanity. He's standing in sheer, unadulterated godlessness and hatred, in fact. And in this chapter, there, there shines something as well of exquisite beauty. Jesus is on trial. He's on trial before the, the Roman authorities and before the Roman governor of Judea in particular, Pontius Pilate. And John describes the scene for us. And it's a, a scene that kind of a, occurs in two different acts with a, a form of maybe an intermission, a, a dark kind of somber, grisly pause. And so there's, there's two different acts here that follow basically uh, through the same different scenes, but in reverse order. In verses 28 through 32, Jesus is handed over to Pilate for execution. In verses 33 through 38, Jesus is cross-examined by Pilate. And then in the verses that end chapter 18, Jesus is actually, in a way, defended by Pilate. And then in the first three verses of chapter 19, there's kind of this interlude, this intermission, right? Where, where, where Jesus is, he's, he's spat upon, he, he, he's beaten, he's, he's mocked by these, these, these cruel thugs and soldiers, right? And then the kind of same scenes, but now in reverse order, play out in the second act in chapter 19, where Jesus is defended by Pilate and cross-examined by Pilate, and then now handed over by Pilate for crucifixion. Two great acts that kind of meet together in the middle with this sinister mocking of Jesus. And, and I believe that John intends for us to catch several strands of thought here. Uh, on the stage are Jesus and Pontius Pilate. In the, the background are the Roman soldiers and Caiaphas, the high priest. And the first thing that I think John wants us to see is that, that Jesus is rejected by the world. This is what John has been telling us from the very, very beginning, from the opening prologue of his gospel, that, that Jesus came into the world and that the world did not recognize him and that he came to his own and his own even did not recognize him. Uh, the, the blindness of the world and, and, and the rejection of Jesus that goes on here by the Jews, the meeting together of this in this passage is, is almost like the world and the religious people coming together is like a climactic evil conspiracy going on, even though that wasn't the case. And in this trial, there is exposed the hypocrisy of, uh, of the religious people of Jesus' time and the, the weakness of the world, the hypocrisy of the religious, right? Did you notice how, how John records, how, how John kind of underlines the telling of the story in the drama here? Pilate has to move from within the praetorium to outside of the praetorium. Uh, the Jewish leaders cannot enter into where Pilate is at because it's a Gentile palace and, and they are obsessed with the external ceremonies uh, that they've have to go on through for, for cleanliness. And they didn't want to, to risk being defiled and thereby become unable to, to celebrate the Passover and so they couldn't enter into where he was at. He had to come out to them. These men, think of it, these men who have murder in their hearts, their sole intent is to kill Jesus, but they are externally concerned that they, they do not enter into this place that would defile them, right? 
It would be hard to give a, a greater illustration of hypocrisy than that. They are concerned about outward cleanliness, but they're altogether unconcerned about the righteousness of God. They, they plead with the Roman authorities to set free a criminal, a, a man who, who John describes as a, a robber, but had more than likely committed other numerous crimes, crimes including ones that were worthy of capital punishment. And they would have him be released rather than Jesus. The, the hypocrisy of the, of the religious people, the weakness of the world. Three times, Pilate says, I find no fault in this man. I, have no, I find no basis to, to charge him. I mean, it's kind of like lawyer speak, right? And there's no basis for a charge here. That's what he's saying. Three times he says it. And then he gives in. Pilate has Jesus scourged despite the fact that he says three times, I can find no reason why he's even being arrested. And scourging is a infliction of, of just terrible, terrible wounds. The Bible, the Bible doesn't describe this scourging and, and the Bible doesn't really go into graphic detail of, of the crucifixion. But, but at the time of John, the people knew what this meant. The people knew what scourging was. The people knew what crucifixion was because they could see it. They could go to where it took place. They, they saw it on a daily basis. They knew what this was. Now, we're not absolutely certain about every blow and each element of the manner in which scourging was inflicted, but the Romans had, had made scourging a, a punishment for a, a number of, of different breaches of the law. And, and it was such a gruesome act that it was against the law, in fact, to do it to Roman citizens, except for some very extreme circumstances. And the Jewish manner of scourging was to lay a man down on the ground with his face in the dust and just to, to beat his back, right? But that was unlikely to be what was going on for Jesus here. This was a, a Roman scourging. They had, they had perfected this, where, where they would have tied the man to a post, right, and, and, and torn his shirt off or taken off his cloak or whatever he was wearing so that his, his, his back was exposed so he didn't have any sort of protection. Uh, they would often bend the man over in some sort of way that it would tighten up that skin on the back so that that very first whip, that, that, that first infliction of these cords would, would have a, a chance to really dig in and get in there, right? And, and these flails that they used would have little bits of bone or, or little pieces of metal fastened in these cords on the ends of these whips. And, and they, would, they would try to inflict the most severe damage possible. And perhaps 39 lashes, according to the Roman ritual. Uh, and sometimes it's told uh, that they, as they would do this, it would just tear into the flesh so extremely, so gruesomely that things like bones could be exposed and just horrific, horrific things. And before we even get to the cross, and before we even get to the crucifixion, this occurs. This occurs here right outside the palace of Pontius Pilate. Something so degrading and so dehumanizing. And what should pain each and every one of us, all of us, is not that we're capable of doing this, but that we are capable of doing this to Jesus. Because you see, it was our sin and our love that put him there. So Jesus is rejected by the world. But John wants us to see something else here as well. Another kind of strain of thought 
as these two different acts play themselves out, um, he wants us also to see that Jesus is along the way fulfilling the purposes of God. He also says this in, in verse 5 and then again in verse 14 that, that there is an aspect in which what is happening to Jesus here is only fulfilling what God had intended for Jesus from the very, very start. John is interested in a couple of different phrases, these, these words that are uttered, Pilate utters them, the words that Caiaphas had uttered, that, that there was one man dying for the people. And then behind it, there lies this absolutely extraordinary truth that those men didn't even know as they were saying it, what it meant. Pilate saying it in, in verse 5, behold the man. And then again in verse 14, behold the king, right? Isn't it extraordinary that, that Pilate should say this even more than once, in fact? Behold the king. And I think in that, and in these phrases that, that John is saying to you and me, do you understand that, that this ungodly man actually got it right? That, that Jesus was indeed truly the king. That he was the Lord of glory. Behold the man, this, this broken man, this bent man, this bleeding man, this lacerated and torn man, this, this man for other men, this true man, the best man that ever was, and behold him. Behold him as he bleeds. Behold him as he undergoes such torment and trial and punishment and pain. Behold your king. Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. Look at verse 32. Pilate says to them, take him for yourself. Take him. You guys judge him. You judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, no, we're not permitted to put anybody to death. That the word of Jesus there might be fulfilled which he spoke signifying about what kind of death that he was about to die. Now, why is this so important? Why is it so important that Jesus should die in this way, uh, by crucifixion rather than by heart failure or cancer or drowning? Well, it had to be this way because Jesus is being hung on a cross because he will bear the curse that is associated, that is, that is spoken of in the book of Deuteronomy, that that in order to take our place, in order to be the man for us, it had to be this way. And all the, the gospel writers make note of the, the crown of thorns that's pushed down upon Jesus' head. Why do they make note of that? Well, what is the significance of it, right? What is the significance of the crown of thorns? Well, ask yourself, where else in the Bible have I maybe heard about thorns. Where else did you read about thorns, right? And it's in the book of Genesis. It's at the fall, that the consequences of the fall, that, that thorns and thistles, right, would be mankind's life curse. That the expression of God's curse in labor was thorns. And Jesus is becoming, so to speak, the second man, the final Adam. Uh, that he's taking upon himself those thorns that he's crowned them upon his head because Pilate is saying, behold your king. And he's taking this curse and he's putting it on his head and he's nailing it to the cross and he's walking and defeating the flames of hell for you and for me. Do you notice in Verses 39 and 40. Pilate unwittingly plays a part in this extraordinary custom that, that at the, the Passover, a man condemned to death, a criminal, guilty of capital crimes, right? That he should be let free. As kind of a, a symbol of the Passover. Perhaps that when, when the, the lamb had been slain and the, the blood had been sprinkled all over the, the beams, the, the, the doorposts, that the angel of death would, would pass over, that, that death would not visit, right? And somehow, and it's not a biblical thing, it, it's become a custom that had grown. And, and they would say, uh, we want to release this one man, this person, to set him free. And so you would think at this point, they would say, yeah, release Jesus, right? 
You'd think that's what they'd want to say. You would think that's what you and I would say if we had been in Jerusalem that day, right? Wouldn't we be inclined to say, oh yeah, I totally would have been down. I would have been like, uh, let's, let's get that Jesus guy out of jail, right? I don't think he did anything wrong. Let's set him free. And it, and it still, to this day, shocks us, doesn't it, when they say, uh-uh, not Jesus. Barabbas! Give us Barabbas. The thief, possibly he's a murderer. Give us him instead of Jesus. Barabbas. You guys want Jesus or Barabbas? Barabbas! Each and every one of them. Give us Barabbas. Which one do you want? Barabbas. Definitely Barabbas. And so they choose Barabbas. You remember that day when Jesus had come into Jerusalem? We, we celebrated on Palm Sunday. And just days before this occurs, they're rejoicing, right? They're celebrating. It was the day when the, the shepherds would come into town and they would bring the Passover lambs into the city. And, and it would have been an extraordinary sight. I mean, thousands, if not even tens of thousands of these little lambs. Uh, they would have been on every street corner and every nook and every cranny of Jerusalem. And you could hardly move without bumping into one of these, these little lambs that were the Passover lambs. And, and then here comes walking into, into their midst the, the, the Passover lamb himself, right? Who has come to lay down his life in order that the curse due from our sin could be removed. And then there's something else because John makes an allusion to it in, in verse 19 to a moment when Jesus is in this trial with Pontius Pilate and, and Jesus all of a sudden doesn't say anything, Right? It says, Jesus gave him no answer. What was Jesus doing here? I mean, why, why, why didn't Jesus respond? Why didn't Jesus answer the question? Do you think maybe John had a bigger point he's making here? Maybe he's saying something to you and me. And what I think John is probably saying here is, do you remember? Do you remember back to Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53 says this. It says that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land and of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with a wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. And I think not only is John saying, do you remember those words? He's also saying in the self-consciousness of Jesus that Jesus remembered those words as well. And he is now identifying himself as the suffering servant of the Lord, coming into this world for the redemption of his people. Jesus is exposed to the rejection of this world. And yet, at the very same time, Jesus is fulfilling each and every one of the prophecies that God had ever laid down with regard to him. And in the chaos of this event and in the tragedy of this event God is still at work and then there's this final thing that, that John wants us to see he wants us to see that Jesus is condemned 
We've seen him rejected. We've seen him fulfilling the purposes of God. And at last, we see him handed over for crucifixion. Jesus dies and Barabbas lives. It's often asked, can you imagine anyhow, you're walking down the street and you, you, you see Barabbas the next day, right? You see him walking down the streets of Jerusalem. Maybe he's buying some groceries or whatever. Can you imagine seeing him walking the street free and you, you walk up to him and you're like, Barabbas, Barabbas, you're free. Barabbas, how are you still alive? And the only answer that Barabbas could give was that Jesus had died in his place. That's the only answer Barabbas could give. Jesus died in my place. I've been set free. And it's like an acted out parable, isn't it? John is saying to us, do you hear the gospel right here? This is the gospel. This is what it is all about. It doesn't get any better than this. Three times in the book of John. Luke has it five times. But three times the verdict is passed. That Jesus is not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. It's almost like a, a ringing bell. And if he's not guilty, well then, how come? Why? Why is he condemned? What, what are the charges? In verse 33, it's treason against Caesar. In verse 7 of, of chapter 19, it's blasphemy in that he made himself God. Those are the two charges, treason and blasphemy. And what is the significance of that? Well, the significance of that is that these are precisely the charges that are leveled by God against you and against me. Treason because we have refused to have God as our king. Blasphemy because we have made ourselves to be God. In a way, what is happening here in this passage is what Luther called the great exchange. The accusations leveled against us are being leveled against Christ, right? He who was not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, is being found guilty for me. Guilty for me. Guilty for me. Behold your king, Pilate says. Behold your king. It's like the song says, Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Never, never have they. Let me ask you right now, what's your response to this? What's your response to this story? Because our response says something about our heart. Is your response to want to sing, you know, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. You want to sing that? Is that how you feel? Awesome if you do. Or, or is your reaction that you want to be with the chorus of voices saying, away with him, crucify him, be gone. In the midst of the story, right in the middle of it, Pilate says the most amazing thing. He says, what is truth? And Jesus is answering, I am the truth. I am the one who makes sense out of all of this. The, the one who integrates the, the mess of this world as the world seeks to satisfy itself, a world where without Jesus there is really no eternal meaning. And only Jesus can do this. Only in Jesus can we make sense of all of this. Only in Jesus can we find meaning greater than just self-satisfaction. 
So what is your response to Jesus? Our eternal destiny hinges on that response. Do we crown him or do we crucify him? Which will it be? Which will it be for you in your life? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time that we've had together and for your word and for your love. We thank you, Lord, that we are reminded that each and every one of us are given a choice, given the opportunity to respond to your love. And God, it's a a binary decision. It really is. We're either going to accept Jesus, we're going to love Jesus, we're going to ask Jesus to be the light of our life, the Lord of our life, we're going to ask Jesus to come and take our sin, we're going to repent of those sins and turn away from them and turn towards you. Or God, the alternative is to turn to ourselves, to prop ourselves up as a a God, to listen to our own counsel, to seek out our own wisdom, to believe that we are the solution. But that is the problem, God. We are not the solution. We are the problem. And God's sin invades each and every one of us, and it gets into our heart, and it creates darkness, it creates confusion. And God, I pray against that, and I pray that everyone who's in this very moment listening and praying, that they would hear me clearly. We all have a choice. What are we going to do with Jesus? Will we crown him or will we crucify him? And God, I pray that each and every one would choose to make him Lord of their life. God, maybe they've already done this, and maybe they need to renew their commitment. Right now, maybe they need to just say, yes, God, I've, I've made that commitment. He's our Lord, but oh, I've just really not been living that out. God, I pray today that people would turn away from their sin and repent and renew their relationship with you, turn back to you. And God, for those who have never done it before, I pray that right now in this very moment, they would just stop, they would pause, even right now across the world and watching television screens and phones and computer screens, they would just say, yes, God, I am the problem. I am a sinner. I am in need of a Savior. I have messed this up and I can't fix it. I need a Savior. I need Jesus. So Jesus, I pray that you would come into my life. Jesus, I pray that you would be my Lord. Jesus, I pray that you would help me turn away from my sin and turn towards you, hoping and knowing and trusting that in you and you alone is eternal life. And God, if we do that, if we turn away from our sin, if we put our hope and trust in you, then you tell us, that you have then therefore received us and redeemed us. That is what Jesus went to the cross for. That he could take upon himself our sin and that we could take upon ourselves righteousness. God, we thank you for that great exchange. We thank you for that gift. We thank you for your love. We thank you for sending us Jesus. Jesus, we thank you. We love you and praise you in his name. Amen. Well, again, thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for worshiping with us. I pray wherever you are that you are blessed. Find ways to love, to serve, and to always make much of Jesus. That's what we're about here at Glory Baptist Church. And if we can do that for you, let us know. Hope to see you soon. God bless. Bye.